All right, so if you would, take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. I may talk and a little fast, and the, um, we've got about 15 verses we want to read this morning. And if you're just joining us with Facebook Live, uh, again, we, we went over our prayer list, and we do lift up our pastor, Tony, Harold, in our prayers and that the Lord just helps him and heals him and restores his health and... Um, we, we all love him very much, and most everyone who knows Pastor Harold loves him, and just a great man of God. And, you know, he won't say he's great, but uh, those whom he loves will say that he's got a great love and compassion towards people, and we do pray for his recovery. But this morning, as we worship the Lord and we open up a portion of his word, we want to open our hearts. We want to ask God to open our hearts, our eyes, our minds and that we can see his word. There's something here that he teaches us. In Acts chapter 17, the name of the sermon is Turning the World Upside Down. We're going to start in verse 1. We're going to read through verse 15. Now, when they had passed through Pamphipolosis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. Now he's talking about Paul and Silas. This is the second missionary journey. Where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and rise again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. And some of them believed, and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. But the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city up on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring him out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason hath received and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and of the other, they let them go. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night into Berea, who coming in thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Therefore many of them believed, also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men not a few. But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea, they came hither also and stirred up the people. And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go as it were, to the sea, but Silas and Timotheus abode there still. And they that conducted Paul brought him into Athens, and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus for to come to him with all speed, they departed. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come again this morning worshiping you and thanking you, Father, for the forgiveness of sins. We ask, Father, to forgive us of our sins and our shortcomings. And Father, we trust and we believe in the cross of Jesus Christ where he died. He was buried and he raised again on the third day. Father, we look upon him. We repent of our sins before you as our law giver, our judge. And Father, you convict our hearts and bring guilt. Father, we turn to your sacrifice. We turn to Jesus Christ with the love which he loved us and gave his life for our sins. Father, we look to him in faith and trust. Father, we do pray your blessings upon the, the teaching this morning. Father, may you just be with each heart, each mind, as we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, hopefully we get to, we're not going to read all 15 verses, we're not going to go expositorily, verse by verse, but this is a pickup from our Acts series, which we had started a couple months ago, and what a blessing it has been to reach this point in Acts chapter 17. We're about halfway through the book of Acts, but we see a pattern here. We see a pattern in the Old Testament, and we even see a pattern in today's churches that we can't quite escape. 
we see the persecution of God's people. Now, one thing we need to remember is that God did not create the world the way it is today. God created the world in perfection, and, and he said it was good. And what, what happened? Well, sin entered into the world, and man fell. And as a result, the Bible teaches us that when man, Adam and Eve, fell, God cursed the world. He brought about spiritual blindness upon the world. And so today, we don't live in that perfect paradise which they had before sin. We live in a dark world of sin who hates God. That's, I don't have to tell you that's the world we live in. You live in it. And so you see that the world already is upside down. But we know that the Lord is having a time where he knows that at the end of all things, he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. But right now, right now, and even the beginning of the Old Testament, what did God do? God sent messengers throughout redemptive history, throughout time. God has sent messengers to the people, to those who are in the dark, sinful world to repent. And we see that, you know, such people that God sent into the world from the prophets to this time and the early church to even today, they are upsetting the status quo of the world. They're upsetting the system. They're upsetting and they're disturbing the comfort of sinners. Because what we're doing is we are preaching a warning from God of his wrath to come upon sin and sinners. That disrupts their world. They turn things right side up from God's perspective. When we go preach the gospel and repent and believe, for God shall surely come and pour his wrath upon you on judgment day. Unless you repent and believe the gospel, believe Jesus Christ, and you will be saved from the wrath of God. When we go and we preach that, they become upset, and in God's eyes, that's turning the world right side up. But to the lost, what are we doing? We're turning their world upside down. They need to realize the world which they live in was not the purpose, is not the design of the Creator. The world you're living in already is turned upside down. And so no, we know that God will bring a new heaven and a new earth. Well, there's some examples through the Old Testament. Think, think about Elijah. Elijah, when he ministered in the dark days of Ahab and Jezebel, Ahab was an evil man, more so than any of his other predecessors. You can pick up his story in 1 Kings chapter 16. And worse, he was married to Jezebel, who was a wicked daughter of a pagan king, uh, Sidon. And she even incited, Abel, uh, uh, he incited Ahab to turn God's people to, towards idolatry down a, a wicked path. And finally, uh, Elijah uh, promised that a devastating drought would strike Israel. It upset Ahab's world. It upset Jezebel's world. It upset the lost world, so much so that Ahab said, quote, Are thou he that troubleth Israel? He met Elijah face by face. And Elijah's like, I'm not the one troubling Israel. You are the one troubling Israel. And uh, Elijah turned Ahab and Jezebel's world upside down, and they didn't like it. The, the, Elijah came preaching, and he came charging them with sin, with rebellion against God. People don't like that. And Jeremiah, Jeremiah cried out that the city of Judah would fall at the hand of the Babylonians. And Jeremiah 38, this infuriated all the court officials, and they dragged Jeremiah before King Zedekiah, demanding that Jeremiah be put to death. And their charge for Jeremiah was they, he was discouraging the people and not seeking for their well-being. As we get accused today of Christians of disrupting the apple cart and charging people and, and trying to make people uncomfortable of their well-being. But Jeremiah was proclaiming God's message to the doomed, rebellious people. Yet from their upside-down perspective, he was guilty of treason. 
Amos. God sent Amos with the message of warning to the northern kingdom of Israel. And instead of them heeding to the warning, they brought Amos to King Jeroboam and accused him of conspiring against the king and that the land was not able to endure all his words. And so the religious leader, the priest, Amaziah, he told Amos, go thy way, go somewhere else and prophesy, get away from us. Amos was turning Amaziah's world upside down, and he didn't like it. Now, from Paul and Silas, which we see here in chapter 17, I wanted to read all 15 verses so we had the context behind the treatment that we see of God's messengers in today's world. And so, starting from Acts 13, we see Paul, as soon as he started hitting the ground running, preaching from Antioch and up into the Gentile and the Greek world, we see chapter after chapter after chapter. It seems like it's been the same story. Uh, every chapter in Acts, that they're getting ran out of town, they're getting beaten. And more than once, we see that the, the Jews, the, the false religion or whatever it is, comes in and starts conspiring these stories against God's people and they start uh, making the people you know roar up they start being false accusations against them in fact uh, right here in Thessalonica and this if you know this is actually the beginning of the church of Thessalonica when we read in Thessalonians uh, right before this they had just been ran off from Philippi it's about a hundred miles from Philippi to uh, Thessalonica. And so they cross. Now they're in about, they're in southern Turkey or about Greece. Northern Greece is where you have Thessalonica, is one of the major trade routes of that town. But what we want to see here is what characterizes a person who shakes up the world for the gospel. From the narrative of Acts 17, we see three key words we want to talk about this morning courage, contentment, and conflict. Courage, contentment, and conflict. Leadership and ministry or sharing the God's word takes courage today. One summer morning, as Ray Blankenship was preparing his breakfast, he gazed out the window and saw a small girl being swept along in the rain-flooded drainage ditch outside his Andover home. Blankenship knew that farther on downstream, the ditch disappeared with a roar underneath a road and then emptied into the main culvert. Ray dashed out the door and raced along the ditch trying to get ahead of the foundering child. Then he hurried himself into the deep, churning water, Blankenship surfaced and was able to grab the child's arm. They tumbled over and over in the water and out of the water within about three feet of going over this culvert. Ray's free hand felt something, possibly a rock protruding from one of the banks. He clung desperately, but the tremendous force of the water tried to tear him away from the child and they kept going under and back up, under and back up. He said, if I can just hang on until help comes. But he did better than that. By the time the fire department came, Blankenship had pulled the girl to safety. Both were treated for shock. On April 12, 1989, Ray Blankenship was awarded the Coast Guard Silver Life Saving Medal. The award is fitting. For this selfless person was at even greater risk to himself than most people know. Ray Blankenship could not swim. And he went out on courage. Paul tells Timothy that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. He said, Be thou therefore not ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel, according to the power of God. Courage, we see, is given and encouraged by God. One of my, my favorite passages of scripture when it comes to courage is Joshua. When, uh, you know, the rains had left Moses and now Joshua was to be in charge of God's people. This is what he tells Joshua. Uh, there shall 
in Joshua 1, 5, he says, There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous. This is God charging Joshua to be of good courage, be very courageous. In Deuteronomy 31.6, Moses charges the people, be strong and of good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them, for the Lord thy, good, thy God, he is he that doeth go, go with thee, excuse me, he will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. So not only is courage encouraged and given by God to us to preach and teach his word and share his gospel in the face of enemies, but courage is also built on faith. David was in a spot where we know he was relentlessly pursued by his enemies. How many psalms do we see that where David's in a tight spot? He's relentlessly pursued by his enemies and the fear that he could have. But he repeatedly proclaimed that he had absolute trust in God during these times. In Psalm 27, 1, he says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? And we see that courage is built and must be built on faith. And Paul echoed this in Ephesians 6, chapter 10. He says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The key to courage is believing in God's sovereign power, his providence, and that all things will work together for them who are thee called and who he will work all things together for our good and his glory. There's not an accident that happens in our lives as God's people, but he calls us to courage. Courage also comes from results from purity. We confess our sins before God. Uh, this is evident with David. David in Psalm 710, he says, My defense, my shield is of God, which saveth the upright in heart. God judgeth the righteous, and God is angry with the wicked every day. God is angry with the wicked every day. But David, when he was faced with difficult trials, he declared that there was no unconfessed sin. He prayed to the Lord and had no unconfessed sin before him before he asked God to help him and deliver him. For he knew that courage results from purity. Courage results from unconfessed, having no unconfessed sin. Courage also comes from hope. Hope Thanking God in advance for the victory. In Sunday school, we sang Faith is a Victory, and it's a wonderful song, and Buell Kazee writes the, the book, Faith is a Victory, which is highly recommended. But here's a story, and I, I'm sorry you don't have enough time to go into all of them, but in Second Chronicles 20, this is a good one if you write it down. Uh, Judah was faced, they faced an invasion by a combined force of Moabites and Ammonites. They were going to get just slaughtered. So they had all of these people coming up against them, two nations, two nations coming up, and that they were going to slaughter them. King Jehoshaphat, knowing Judah was powerless against the enemies, prayed to the Lord for help. He then led his people out to meet the attackers. But in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 21, it says that before the battle began, you know what Jehoshaphat did? Right before his army, he sent singers. Before his army, he sent out a worship team. <laughs> and they were praising God, and they were singing unto God and giving God thanks for his faithfulness. They were praising God, and they were being thankful to God for the victory in advance of whatever thy will, it will be done. Well, and I tell you, if you look also in verse 22, you probably don't have to imagine too much what happened after that. God just splatting the Moabites and the Ammonites. I don't even know if the army got off the field. <laughs> I mean, God's pleased. 
He, they had the courage. Thanking God in advance gave the people courage to anticipate the victory. Thanking God in advance gave the people courage to anticipate the victory. When the gospel you are preaching, you're sharing, or you're living causes people's world to turn upside down, we must first look to God for courage. As we see in chapter 17 and verse 2, And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three, sa three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Paul probably knew what the result of this was going to be. He's done it so many times before. Secondly, we need to understand contentment. Contentment. Now, to turn the world upside down, we see that we share the gospel without embarrassment. We're not embarrassed of our God. We stand fast. We hold fast in the truth of God, and we have courage to stand and preach and teach the gospel and live that way. But we also need to learn contentment with whatever situation that puts us in and whatever the results may be. Here we read in verse 4, and some, well, I don't want to miss the, the actual teaching of the gospel here. In verse 3, Paul opened and alleged that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. You know, one thing you're going to notice over and over and over is the consistency of the gospel. That throughout all of Acts, throughout the New Testament, prophesied in the Old Testament, that this gospel is consistent, that there's salvation in none other than in Jesus. And that's the way that God has always planned it to be. But look at verse 4. Look at the reaction. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas and the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few, but what else? The Jews which believed not moved with envy. And they took them, and we see uh, that's the next uh, point when we get into conflict, but look at the contentment that we must have over and over. Contentment is being in the will of God and not looking at results. And if you flip back to 1419, 14. 19 chapter 14 verse 19 this talks about another time where Paul had given the gospel to the town there in in verse 19 of chapter 14 it says and there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and it sounds like the same story doesn't and having stoned Paul drew him out of the city supposing he had been dead they stoned Paul in this city, assuming he was dead, in verse 20, howbeit as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. Now, imagine you go to, I don't know, go to Winchester, you start preaching the gospel, and somebody comes out and starts beating you to death. And then we see that actually the disciples took Paul and drug him out of the city. And But what happens in verse uh, 24? And after that, what did Paul do during the, in the next town? And after that, they passed throughout Pisidia. They became to Pamphylia. And when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down into Atatilia. Now imagine the discouragement of being that rejected where they were trying to kill you. But Paul was content. Now, let me ask you this. And back to chapter 17 and verse 4, and I, I want to be sincere. I don't want to be condescending or patriot. Or I don't want to, you know, patronize anybody uh, because some people really believe this or their belief system leads to this conclusion. In chapter 4, when it said some of them believed, and in, ch in verse 5, I'm sorry, in verse 4, some believed, and in verse 5, some believed not. Now, here's the question. Does that mean that Paul and Silas were half successful getting people saved and half failures for not getting people saved? Some didn't believe. Does that mean that they were a failure? 
Some did believe. Does that mean that, that they were, should glory in themselves and their ability that some believed? Look at the results. Now, a lot today, a lot of people are result-oriented driven. Churches are result-oriented driven. They, they feel like they've sown the seed of the word of God. Imagine going through this beating. Imagine going through the courage that you had to go through. Imagine flying in the face. Remember, you, uh, you lose all your friends when you're saved, right? And you're out on this island and you're preaching the word. And the people are not believing it. Should you be discouraged? No, we are not result-oriented driven. We are obedience-oriented driven. What, what are we to do as God's people? We're to sow the word of God. We're to be faithful to the truth. We're to preach the truth, right? Uh, with all of our hearts, with worship and spirit and truth, we are to seek the truth of the word of God. And we are to proclaim the gospel as God's people. But it's God which gives the increase. The salvation is of the Lord. So I cannot be encouraged in myself or discouraged in myself if I've preached and bled to death, was stoned to death, drawn out of town, and then woke up and then went preaching again, and nobody believed. I can't be discouraged in myself. All I know is I have joy because I'm doing what God has commanded me to do. When you start getting into results driven, you start getting into dangerous ground because uh, you are putting the result of being saved or not saved directly upon your shoulders. Now, that's upon God. That's right. And so when people are saved, what are you doing? You're getting pride. Oh, look how great a soul winner I am. Mm -hmm. Or if people are not getting saved, you have discouragement saying there must be something wrong. But we know that we are to teach sound doctrine. We are to strive for the truth. You know, if you are sharing the gospel, you're being a testimony, and important, you are doing it in the truth and the will of God, and for his glory, you are automatically successful no matter what the results are. You're successful. And I, there's another sermon, The Success of the Sower. So we see we overcome fear with courage and we overcome rejection with contentment. We overcome uh, persecution with contentment because salvation is God's work. Sowing the seed is our work. We should not get the two confused. We can and should be content and no matter what the results are or the circumstances that come up. And that brings me the, the conflict. I don't have a lot of time to go into this, but um, we see in verse 5 through 10 that immediately they were envious, right? And then what did the Jews do? Well, why were they envious? Now, let me ask you this question. This wasn't my experience, but this was some of your all's experiences. When you were saved, let's say you were the only one saved in your family. When you were saved, and I, I believe I hear a pastor talk about this sometimes, the parents almost become upset about it. Because what's happening? is it's disrupting the family unit, right? It's, it's disrupting whatever, whatever was going on, those Saturday picnics, Friday, or whatever get-togethers, or whatever happened. If you have a lost family and you're the only one saved, you're disrupting what they were doing. You're starting to shine light, the light of Jesus Christ, into some of that darkness. And they are getting upset, not just with you. If they love you, not so much with you, but with the preacher or the church that turned you, right? That's who they're really mad at. Well, why did you go to that place? They're really mad. And that's what happened with the Jews. Here you have uh, Jews being saved by the preaching of the gospel. And they're turning from the works. They're turning to faith. And what's happening is this Jewish relation, the nation, they had this organization. You're plucking our best people from us. And they got envious. They got mad. Because they're starting to see this momentum. And that's really big in, in the, the day and the time of Acts, the early church. There was a huge momentum going forward. I mean, there were thousands being saved. It seems like every other page, right? So there was this huge momentum, this huge work going on early. And so they became envious. And what they do, they, they accused them falsely. And they drug out Jason. 
And so they were trying to stir up the people to hate them too. Because maybe just their voice alone wasn't going to make a change. So they had to stir up the whole world. And that's what we see today in our lives. We see the whole world stirred up today about Christians, about biblical thinking, about biblical principles. Uh, people want us to compromise the truth. People want us to do this. People want us to be acceptance of that. Or, or and, you know, and that is the thing is you, in some of these churches, they offer a watered-down gospel. They, they offer this watered-down lessons and things. Like, can we not just make our wills mutually ex uh, inclusive with the world? And it doesn't work that way. We don't see that reaction given to the prophets from the Old Testament to Acts to now. That's not the normal response. Complacency, apathy is not the more normal response to the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ where you are calling them out in their sin and saying that you are standing guilty before an all-holy, mighty God who has promised that He will pour His wrath upon you. You are one heartbeat away from eternity paying for your sins. You know, I was thinking this morning when I woke up, I was like, you know what? I I wonder if I never woke up. You're never going to realize you didn't, right? But you know what? To be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord, when you die here, you need to be saved. You need to be saved. You need to confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and avoid the wrath of God. I got one thing to quote from C.S. Lewis, and then I'm done. I like this quote. C.S. Lewis says, What does Jesus say to us about persecution? And what resources does he provide for such things or in such times? We should begin by noting that Jesus was steeped in Scripture and knew all about the persecution and suffering of the prophets and other godly people in the Bible. People like Daniel, and from Daniel 6, and his three friends, and Daniel 3, and others. He knew that such evil ultimately grows out of the spiritual darkness, the blindness, the error, and sin that dominates the hearts of fallen people and calls him to resist truth and righteousness. He knew that as God's suffering servant, Isaiah 53, he would experience the full assault of men and devils against his earthly ministry and would ultimately die by crucifixion. He understood as well the opposition that his followers would face from their own families, their communities, the world, and the devil, and he sought to prepare them. Jesus frequently warned his followers that they would face persecution and suffering. The first instance comes at the beginning of his ministry when Jesus taught the Sermon on the Mount. This teaching was and still is a basic training about living a life in God's kingdom and how to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. He began with the Beatitudes, which is a, pro which is a profile of a disciple, a Christian, and includes a readiness to suffer. And the Beatitudes that he quotes is Matthew chapter 5, verse 10 through 12. And if you want to flip there, we'll, we'll be done. Matthew chapter 5. We'll read just the, the first couple Beatitudes. We won't read them all. But I like that. I like what C.S. Lewis said about the Beatitudes being the basic training of the Christian in this life. And... Matthew chapter 5. Look at verse 10. He says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely, for my sake. Didn't we just read that? Rejoice. What should we do? Rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. God has called upon us, his churches, and us individually in the church to preach, teach the word to all nations. He's, that's what he's charged us to do. Declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. Just as Paul, Silas, the early churches, and the prophets, they turned the world upside down, so should we. We disrupt. The gospel of the Jesus Christ disrupts. We don't do it to disrupt. We don't do it for them to hate us, but we do it 
out of joy, out of obedience to God. Because one day God will open up and he will create a new heaven and a new earth. He'll destroy this earth. But until then, we preach the wrath of God against all sin and sinners. And at the same time, we preach the salvation of the Lord and the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. For he so loved us that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. What a promise. Let's all stand. And Brother Chapman, if you please come. The Lord's spoken to your heart at all this morning. We invite you to come. Amen.